My name is James Kelly. I've been at Juniper since 2006. Uh, you heard Mansoor talk earlier today about the most recent inflection in what's happening in data center, and that's my topic. I'm also going to be building on what Chris talked about. So I'm going to be talking about AI clusters and doing some demonstrations of what we've got as examples for AI clusters in terms of the different designs that I'll go through in just three slides first. And then I'll actually demonstrate how you can play around with these designs yourself in Astra Cloud Labs um, and how you can actually look at the entire configuration of all of the switches with all of the additional things that, uh, that are put on top of the standard uh, IP fabric reference design in Astra specific to AI clusters for training where the networking problems are, are a little bit beyond what we see in the traditional data center space. All right, so with that quick introduction, I wanted to set the stage of why networking is important when it comes to building AI clusters. Um, you know, we are all familiar, I'm assuming, with the NVIDIA stock price, and the reason for that is GPUs are very expensive, and building AI clusters, the networking cost is really, whether it's from a TCO perspective or from a CapEx perspective, it's relatively small compared to the overarching bill that you're going to be paying when these servers are using, you know, somewhere between 10 and 16 times the power of a traditional data center server, and they're hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, if you're talking about an NVIDIA DGX H100 that has eight of the H100 GPUs in it, it's about 400 grand. Um, so when you're spending all of this money, um, you know, why is the network important? Uh, so the reason is very simple that I put on the slide here. If the network is a bottleneck that delays the training job completion, then expensive GPU time is wasted, and the training becomes network bound instead of compute bound. So obviously this is a problem, you know, AI training, where we want it to become compute bound. We want it to effectively scale linearly or as close to it as possible with the number of GPUs that we add, right? But just like, you know, a Kubernetes cluster or these other types of data center applications or cloud applications that are distributed, what holds all of those distributed applications together, that's the network, right? So at the end of the day, you know, a training model that is, or a model to be trained in a cluster of different GPUs is going to have to be distributed across all of the GPUs and effectively network together. And the way that this works, obviously, is that the model itself usually doesn't fit on a single GPU, right? Um, so it, the model is divided up. And then for purposes of moving in parallel, the data set, which is also humongous, is also divided up. So there's all of this parallelization that happens in an AI cluster when it comes to training. And as that parallelization kind of needs to get reconciled um, for, the, for the checking and the evolution of the model over the course of the training across the different jobs, that's where there's tons of communication over the network, right? And inside of these networks, they're also, I said, you're, they're not your average data center. Right? Your average data center is probably connected on your revenue-facing ports at maybe like 10 gigs per second, 25 gigs per second, 100 would be considered quite fast. Inside of an AI cluster, the GPU to GPU fabric is connected at 400 gigs per second per GPU. I just said that there's eight GPUs inside of one of those DGX servers. Each one of those has its own 400 gig NIC. So just imagine that. And then the server also has separate NICs that are used um, to connect to the storage cluster. And then it has a 100 gig NIC, which in these servers is the slow <laughs> speed. And that's into the front end management network, where you have some other servers that are responsible called head end nodes to coordinate the training jobs across the, the cluster. So these, these, um, these servers are effectively each connected into three different networks. And the beauty of Astra and the different blueprints is you can actually manage these three networks, which are effectively inside of one data center from one pane of glass, from one Astra, right? Besides the challenge of the speeds and feeds, there's something called rail optimized design that is prescribed by NVIDIA. You know, we all know NVIDIA is the 800 pound gorilla in the space of the GPUs. They, they own the entire stack. They've done some great stuff in terms of innovating inside the server. So there's this technology called NVLink. NVLink inside the server connects all of the GPUs so that when a GPU 
you know, one needs to talk to GPU two, it doesn't need to go out of the NIC to a switch and then back in, it can go over the NV link. So for this reason, the eight GPU NICs are actually not typically connected to the same leaf. So there's not really a concept of like a top of rack switch here. And because there's eight GPUs inside the DGX servers or any of the HGX servers that you'll find they're modeled on the same pattern from Dell, Supermicro, Lambda Labs, etc. You'll see this pattern that I've got in the slide here where the GPU servers at the bottom on the GPU fabric side, those NICs specifically, those eight, they're cabled up where GPU one NIC goes to leaf one, GPU two goes to leaf two, all the way through eight. So you're building your data center or your cluster in these groups of eight leaves. And in Juniper, we call this group a stripe. So this is basically how you build out your data center. It's, it's very different and kind of uh, surprising all the way down to the physical cabling of how these things work. And then typically, you know, other than that, it's a CLO um, fabric. So, you know, every leaf is connected to every spine. The one thing that you typically see in data center networks that's a little bit different here is as a rule of thumb in the storage and the GPU fabric, we don't necessarily recommend doing any kind of oversubscription. Um, so the downward facing access from the leaves uh, in terms of that aggregate carrying capacity is the same as what you see in the fabric up to the spines. Um, and you can imagine that if you're using a lot of 400 gig links from your leafs, you're using state of the art switches uh, like the Tomahawk 4 that Monsoor mentioned, for example, today. And with that, you often see a lot of ports going up to the spines, not just a few, which is also a different physical pattern that's, that's not really necessarily familiar to many people. When it comes to building out data centers, we also think in terms of often building out fixed form factor devices. So you can use the QFX series, like the Tomahawk for you know, QFX 5230 as a leaf, you can use it as a spine as well. Now you'd need many spines. The other way that you could build out your spines is with Juniper's PTX series. We call these high rate switches, but they're basically just chassis modular devices where you can you know, buy a bunch of spines and then add line cards to them over time and grow that way in a little bit more of a progressive manner. Also, the cool thing is, you know, it comes in a four line card, eight line card, and 16 line card variants. In the 16 line card variant that I've got here, you can get up to 576 ports of 400 gig inside the same chassis. And these chassis are 800 gig ready um, for when you know, the Tomahawk 5 base platform comes out on the QFX side as well. So I often get asked, you know, in the scale uh, that you're dealing with, James, in these data centers for AI clusters, you know, do you see us going to super spine? And, you know, generally speaking, you know, that becomes a lot more expensive because of the 400 and eventually the 800 gig optics, right, that you would need just to, just to accommodate all of that cabling even would be very expensive. Um, so really sticking to a three-stage CLO or a two-tier network is pretty important, and that's why in large enough networks, you typically see the preference for some of these high rate spines. So I put together this one slide as sort of like, hey, what's Juniper's maximum GPU cluster that you could build in a three-stage CLO? And these are sort of the numbers, right? If you're using the state-of-the-art QFX 5230 LEAF, which is 64 ports of 400 gig in your stripes, then you can get um, a, you know, 16 H100 servers or 128 GPUs in that stripe. Um, sorry, actually 32. Um, and then you can also get up to 72 stripes connected in if you used 32 of these uh, PTX, uh, PTX spines. So that's just a, a quick example. I'm going to, to now kind of flip into the demonstration mode that I mentioned. So these things look a little bit different um, on slides and we're used to looking at topologies that way. But um, inside of Abstra, you can also automate this kind of rail optimized design where you have stripes of eight leafs. Um, NVIDIA calls it rail because they effectively consider, you know, GPU one going to leaf one and all of the GPU ones inside that stripe going to leaf one a rail, right? And they have different technologies to try to keep traffic within the rail in the ring patterns that happen inside of these training models. Um, so 
oftentimes when it comes time to showing this to customers, we can build out these sorts of slides, but in Abstra, with the rack concept as a logical concept, you can actually just build a rack that's composed of eight different leafs. So you can use the rack logical construct in Abstra, and you can use that basically as your stripe. And that's exactly what we've done with a whole bunch of A100s and H100s. And this is the Terraform Abstra examples repository of the Juniper org. If you go into the different folders, there's different examples. I'm gonna be demonstrating this one. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of racks and templates and um, other things in it for storage. I think that the GPU fabric is the most interesting one to look at because that's where the rail optimized design of the eight way leaf sort of happens. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate this one and it actually shows you a whole bunch of different sizes of GPU clusters of different types and how they're designed. And uh, like I said, you can play around with this in your own instance of Abstra Cloud Labs. I've got another tab here. If you've never heard of it, go to cloudlabs.abstra.com and you can bring up your own instance of like a topology over here of Abstra only. You don't actually need any physical devices to play around with the, the demos that I'm gonna be showing you today. The second demo after that that I'm gonna be going through is the real life lab based configuration of a GPU cluster that we have at Juniper of mixed A100 servers and H100 servers in two different stripes and options for both QFX and PTX binds and all of the additional networking configuration which I'll talk about when I, when I get into that demo. So I'm gonna be going through those in, in order. Um, so, you know, one of you had the question earlier, like what comes first, Terraform or the Blueprint, right? So all of the stuff that the Blueprint is actually created from in this AI cluster designs is done over, um, over you know, Terraform running, in this case, local from my laptop. All that you need to do when you clone this Git repo is go into these provider files and basically set up your admin, password, and IP address to whatever Abstra Cloud Labs gives you. After that, you can just run Terraform in it, Terraform apply, and be off to the races. Everything will show up in your instance of Abstra. So um, that's, that's what I'm going to do. I've actually I've done this before. Before I hit um, Terraform apply and then answer yes, I'm just gonna go into this instance of Abstra and show you this is sort of like a a fresh instance of Abstra. I haven't done anything to it yet. And um, here, you know, if you go into look at the racks, for example, or if you were to go into look at all of the config templates that, uh, uh, sorry, not config templates, but templates that uh, are present, there's a lot of out of the box stuff in Abstra. So instead of adding more out of the box stuff in Abstra for all these AI designs, which we could do, we've just built them in Terraform and open sourced them and you can just import them into your instance of Abstra yourself in a matter of moments, and then you can also tweak them to whatever liking you've got. So I just wanted to show, you know, this is indeed an empty instance of Abstra. I think that, you know, those of you familiar with Terraform will have seen the, you know, now you see it, now you don't, but in reverse, now you don't see it, and now you do. Once I hit yes here, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening inside of this, and here in my, templates design, I suddenly have all of these different templates that I can create a blueprint from of all different sizes. So everything between 512 GPUs and 2048 GPUs of both A100s and H100s, the difference between those from a networking standpoint, by the way, is that the H100s are connected with a 400 gig NIC, the older A100s are connected with a 200 gig NIC, so a little bit different uh, connectivity link requirements when you're you know, setting up your App Store rack um, if, we, if we go into, you know, looking at these templates here, you can see that what we've done, right, this logical rack construct here holds together the eight leaves. And I can optionally show all of the leaves here. And every single server has eight ports. Like I said, there's also actually storage ports and front end ports. Those would be on different network fabrics, and I'll show you that in the next demo. But uh, yeah, this is basically a nice way that you can get and play around with rail optimized designs in Abstra if you'd like to and start tweaking them. Uh, 
whenever we have a customer demo, I ask them, you know, how many GPUs are you looking at investing in? And I can literally like play around with this or tweak one of these and demonstrate exactly what their fabric's gonna look like. So I think it's something kind of fun to play around with. And, you know, while AI clusters are still novel and this pattern of rail optimized design, rail optimized design is novel, it's, it's kind of cool. Do we have any sort of ABs on rail optimized versus non-rail optimized, same workload, same, it's, that, that's one of the hardest parts we always get whenever we say yeah. like, you can do amazing things, now 20% more amazing than the previous solution, which we have no metrics on. Now, like rail optimized, also I'm curious where there's like configuration, discovery, visualization, and ultimately some level of like anomaly detection and actionable change that like you could say we'd get rail optimized, but when does AppStrip begin to say, hey, Things are changing, you need to change your configuration to align to it. Well, remember that these are physical designs, so they're not easy to change right. um, on the fly. But uh, there are some hyperscalers that are using non-rail optimized designs to do different things. Um, you know, some of the news yesterday actually from, from Google and OCP was the Google Falcon Reliable Transport Protocol. So they're looking at actually converging the networks down to one and still being able to get um, the full carrying capacity without you know, the problems of hot spots and cold spots in the network. And you know, these, the GPU to GPU traffic is RDMA. Um, in this case, it's RDMA over ethernet. So it requires effectively a lossless profile. Um, when rail optimized design was introduced, one of the things is it's not just the fact that there's an NVLink switch inside of the server, but the driver for the communications library for model training, they call it NICL, NCCL for, sh for short is the acronym. Um, it has this new technology called PXN um, in it, PCI Express times NVLink or something, they call it PXN for short. And it's able to detect when you're needing to send traffic from, let's say, GPU one inside of this server to GPU two inside of this server. Well, obviously, GPU one and two are not on the same rail, so they're not connected to the same leaf. Well, what it can do is it can actually pass the traffic over to GPU two's NIC internally on the, the server, and then you're basically avoiding a hop across the spines in your, your network. So they're solving for, for latency effectively with that PXN solution, and, um, I think that your question is a great question. I don't have the answer to that of like, when is rail optimized design good and, and how, you know, is it not so good? Those are some of the experiments we're running inside of the Juniper AI cluster lab, actually. Uh, many people will, for example, run their ML commons, ML perf test with all of the servers plugged into the same switch. <laughs> I mean, like you're kind of cheating at that point, right? Cause you don't have any congestion. So our lab is based on this, this topology. Um, and and the write over subscription ratio for the number of servers that we have, so sort of a, a true to form. Well, just the fact that you can do a repeatable way in which you could see the optimal implementation, because you know these are going to become more than one time events, and yeah, as workloads change and and model training capacity changes, this we need to keep going back to a tool that knew why we did it and how we did it the first way. So. Like as a methodology, this is the right way to go because hey, we figured out GPUs trombone too, just like networks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let, let's move on to the, the next demo. I keep on swiping the wrong way. So um, in, the, in the other uh, folder here, you'll find a different example. I've actually already applied this one because it's got a lot more resources, so it takes a couple of minutes to apply it. Um, here you've got not just the logical designs, but actually the instantiation of all three blueprints, so all three fabrics, your front end, your storage, and your GPU to GPU fabric. And inside of those blueprints, um, all of the networking, so for example, all of the creation of the ASN pools for the ASN, the BGP ASNs in the fabric, or the spine to, to leaf fabric um, IP addresses from those pools, all of those things are terraformed, um, and so, also, all of the connectivity down to the server, these are typically routed fabric, so we've used that as a model. So slash 31's down to the server. Um, besides the networking, the other thing that's really important inside of an AI cluster that's gonna be used for training is congestion avoidance and congestion management when it happens. Uh, one of the challenges that we see with traditional ECMP load balancing is the creation of hotspots and cold spots in the network 
um, in particular because we've got a lot of elephant flows in terms of the GPU to GPU traffic. So there's not a lot of flows, but they're very big. So the probability of the random hashing having hash collisions and generating hotspots in the network is, is very problematic. So we turn on dynamic load balancing, which can move flows um, when it sees a small break in them. Um, so it doesn't reorder packets effectively for the end host. Um, in addition to dynamic load balancing, we turn on something called data center QCN, um, quantized congestion notification. It's just like a couple of protocols that have been around for a while um, for Rocky traffic. Uh, Rocky is the R-O-C-E acronym, uh, RDMA over converged ethernet. It requires um, this protocol called PFC, priority flow control, and explicit congestion notification is ECN. The combination of these things, Juniper calls DCQCN, and it's a pretty standard uh, industry acronym. But this is basically looking at the buffer sizes um, and statistically marking packets to tell the end host to slow down when there's too much congestion. Um, so these protocols are also useful. You know, we try to avoid congestion as best as possible to maximize that carrying capacity of the fabric. When that's not possible and congestion happens, the host has to back off. These, are, these protocols are the mechanism by which that gets communicated back to the end host and the NICs have to support it. And you know, certainly uh, the NICs that we have do support it. It's pretty common. So um, inside of all of this stuff, you'll find zero Juno's configuration, right? This is all HCL, for example, right? If I look at my Abstra blueprints, you see the resources for these three blueprints. Um, you can see that I've got some, some HCL to generate, for example, all of the ASN pools and all of the IPv4 pools. Um, the only place where you do see some Juno's configuration, as I mentioned, is Abstra has a standard reference design. And that's part of the, the Juniper validated design, the JVD stuff that Monsoor talked about earlier too. A repeatable design that's very well tested that we know is going to be high quality. Um, inside of these, we need to add the DLB, the dynamic load balancing, and the DCQCN configurations. So we actually do have um, you know, additional Terraform files to lay down that Juno's configuration. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, extra stuff there, I guess you could say. So I've got this in my other window here. And here you can see, as I mentioned, you're managing all three of these networks from one place. Um, and this is, this is the state, I mean, I haven't done anything to this after Abstra Terraform apply happens and it creates 290 odd objects. So if we go into our back end here, you can see staged. And instead of a rack composed of 32 servers, which would be a really expensive lab if Juniper <laughs> invested in that, um, we've got eight of the A100 servers and four of the H100 servers uh, and cabled up into two different stripes we have uh, effectively, it's a bit hard to read, let me turn off the links there, what we call a medium stripe and a small stripe. Um, that's also for diversity. We have one that's based on the QFX 5220, the other one based on the QFX 5230, Tomahawk 3, Tomahawk 4. Um, and we also have a variable inside of that Terraform file that allows you to pick you know, QFX uh, or PTX spines. And I think in this case, I've got the, the, the PTX spines. So um, normally when you create a blueprint in Astra, you've got to go through the build of it and you have to assign all of the resources from the resource pools. And then after that, you have to turn all of the logical devices for the spines and the leaves into interface maps. And then eventually also into actual devices that are in that inventory list that Chris showed earlier. We don't have any physical devices, so that part is, is still yellow. This is all done in a, a virtual instance of Astra in the cloud, as I mentioned. And then I've got my configlets here too. Um, you know, so you can, for example, go and see, if you click on one of these configlets, you can see here's my dynamic load balancing profile and all of the switches that it needs to get um, added to as a little bit of extra configuration beyond the golden standard abstract reference design. And it sort of highlights all of these in green and tell you which one it's applied to as well. So other than that, I think a really interesting feature too is kind of clicking into one of these, these leafs and you can sort of see all of your different, for example, spine facing ports uh, up here and you can see all of your revenue facing ports down here. Uh, some of these are channelized for the 200 gig connectivity because all of our ports are 400 gig uh, native speed. Another thing is you can go to click on rendered over here in the bottom right 
And you can, you know, if you are a networking guy or JCNIE, right, and you want to actually look at all of the configuration, it's all here. So you can scroll through it and you can see all of this stuff. And then way down at the bottom, after all the BGP policy stuff, you've got the configlets generated as well. So all of this stuff was generated uh, from Terraform. And it's, it's really nice to be able to play around with. In the actual AI lab at Juniper right now, we're running a customer POC. Um, but I did want to give a shout out and a thank you to, to Chris, uh, as well as Raj Subramaniam, who's not here today. But Raj has been like furiously coding away, adding to the Abstra Terraform provider for dashboards and building an example reference dashboard for AI clusters. So uh, he, he gave me an instance of Abstra just a, an hour or so ago. And I wanted to, to show that as well. So now you can actually terraform all of your monitoring. And so things like the hot and cold spots in the network or detecting ECMP imbalances, these are things that are native in Abstra, the intent-based analytics probes. And now you can codify those dashboards as well um, for your organization, which is, of course, you know what people that are doing GitOps and infrastructure as code do, right? If you've got a, a Kubernetes cluster as code, all of your Prometheus and your Grafana deployment is also probably done as code. Um, so it's sort of the same thing for, from an Astra monitoring perspective. Now this dashboard doesn't have any interesting information on it because it's not running any traffic. That's the part where we, we have to actually apply this to our lab and run traffic across it. So stay tuned for that demo, probably something that I'll, I'll build in the future. But yeah, all of these probes and widgets and stuff like that were also dynamically generated.